I'm so glad you guys are here. It is so good to see you all today. Uh, I'm glad that you decided to come and make Canvas the, uh, the starting point of your week. And so, um, so yesterday, we were up at the lake. And uh, so my, my in-laws have a lake place in Alexandria, Minnesota. So we're up there with the kids. And um, it, was a, it was one of those things where, okay, so we're up there Thursday, and it rained all day. So how many of you know if you're at the lake and it rains, it's not a great day, right? Like, you're like, oh. And then Friday, it got, like, sunny halfway through the day, so we're, like, soaking it up. And then yesterday was absolutely gorgeous. And so we were, like, soaking it up and enjoying it. And um, there was one point where we're sitting there, and we're sitting on the dock, and we're in the pontoon. And you know those lily pad things? Have you seen those? They're like the big styrofoam things that you roll up and you run off the dock and kids jump on them. They're like, I don't know, they're like five feet wide by like 20 feet long. Have you seen, anyone seen those? Okay, it, okay, three of you have. Okay, this illustration is going nowhere. Um, anyways, it's this big styrofoam thing and the kids love it. They run on it. It's the greatest thing. And so this is happening and then there's the jet ski and it's on the lift and, and then there's the tube. We have a tube hooked up to the back of the pontoon and the kids are jumping on that. And, and it was interesting because in that moment as we're sitting there tied up to the dock, I thought to myself how strange it was what we were doing, right? There's a whole, I'm looking out, there's a huge, beautiful lake, and there's actually people on pontoons going past the dock, and they have their lily pad wrapped up in the back of the boat, and there's people there, and they're waving at us, and we're like, hey, and they're waving. I was like, do we know those people? And I have no idea who they are, but their wave was almost like an invitation to come and be a part of what they were doing. And it was so interesting to me as I sat there because I'm like, here we are in a pontoon full of gas with a jet ski, with a, 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 a tube here and a lily pad, and the kids are having a great time. But I thought to myself, what are we missing out on? Like, this is fun and all, and the kids can run off the dock, and there's three feet of water there, so they're safe and all this stuff. But I thought, there's so much more to this than just what they're experiencing. And, and I think maybe the reason it struck me so much is because of the series that we're in with this Imagine series. This idea of imagining what God can do in and through us. This idea of imagining when we invite God into our process and we trust God and we have faith in God and we believe in God, what God can accomplish through us. And I just thought to myself how random and how strange it is that we're sitting tied off to a dock when here's the whole lake in front of us. Right? Imagine if we'd never left the dock. Imagine if we only ever stayed tied off to the dock. Imagine what we would miss. I think about it. What we do, we wrap up the, the, the lily pad. We go out to the middle of the lake. We, we jump off in our life jackets. The kids hate it because they just want to swim and they're not life jackets. So I was like, I don't care. You're wearing a life jacket. It's okay. We have noodles, all this stuff. They're jumping off. We would miss that. We would miss the idea of like, you know, in, in Minnesota, like the most beautiful sunsets ever are in the summer at the lake. I don't know what it is. It's just, it's how it works. And you're like, how did the sun get so orange right now? Like, it's so beautiful, right? Like, we'd miss that. We'd miss just tooling around the lake and the pontoon. It'd be tragic what we would miss if we never left the dock. But I think so often, that's how we live out our faith in Christ, we become followers of Christ, and, and, and we're, we're, sometimes we're just content or we're okay being tied off to the dock, being tied off to what's comfortable, being tied off to what's familiar, being tied off to what gives us at least a sense or semblance of safety. And we think, hey, this is good enough. I'm in the pontoon, right? And what happens is, is that God has given us faith to move mountains, Right? But we've domesticated it down or dumped it down enough to just say, God, if you could give me a parking spot at the mall, that'd be great. Right? There's, there's what he has to offer for us. Like there's, there's, there's a sea and there's, there's sandcastles to be built by the sea, but too often we're content with the mud pies by a mud puddle. That's what I've used every single Sunday talking about what so often we're content with. We're content with so little when God has so much. We miss what's truly available to us. And that's kind of the, the, the idea of this entire series is, is opening our minds to what's available to us. Opening our minds to, to what we might not be able to see, but what's available to us. And here's the reality. If we ever want to see the sea, we have to be uncomfortable with maybe not being able to see it, but by walking by faith. And that's what we want to talk about today. That's what I want to talk about in this session or sermon of our Imagine series. And if you've been with us week one, we talked about the idea of imagining functioning in freedom. That thought. Maybe you've never imagined the idea of functioning in freedom. 
The idea of, of actually um, being able to, to live a life free of what holds you back. Live a life free of, of sin. Live a, live a life free of addiction. But it says in Scripture that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Right? You guys with me? Okay. Sometimes, I'll just be honest, sometimes when, when you're super quiet, I don't know if you're with me or if you're like, hey, I wonder what we're doing later today. Hmm. I, I understand. I'm the same way. Like, I have, I have ADD. Anyone else? Okay, never mind. Um, so, uh, okay, so functioning and freedom. See, I just did it. That was an ADA, ADA moment. I can't even say it right. Okay, so uh, week two. Imagine a fully funded life. That's what we talked about, this idea of, of living a life that's fully funded. Living a life. Are you, are you kind of frustrated or just done with a feeling of, of not enough, a feeling of that there's just never enough. There's never enough time. There's never enough money. It's kind of a scarcity mentality. And I challenged that with a, a stewardship mentality. This idea that if you steward well what God gives you, if, if you honor God with what he gives you, what he's given to you and what, what he is about to give to you, what you produce, if you steward that well, it says in Scripture, that it'll actually pour out a blessing upon you that's too great for you to even take in. It's amazing what happens. And so that was the, the idea of week one and two, this imagining what God can do in and through us. And so today we're going to talk about an unfazed faith. An unfazed faith. Have you ever seen anyone or known someone who you just, you see their faith and it just seems absolutely unfazed? Like by anything, it is just absolutely unfazed. You know, you hear that they lost their job, but you didn't hear it from them because they didn't tell you. And it wasn't like on Facebook. And it wasn't like this, this outcry on social media. It was You heard it from, hey, did you hear so-and-so lost their job? No, I didn't. Well, how are they doing? Surprisingly well. Like, what do you mean surprisingly well? Aren't they concerned about their mortgage or their car or their whatever? You know, I'm sure they are, but you wouldn't know it by talking to them. They're just unfazed by it. Or the, even the loss of a loved one. Even the loss of a loved one. I think sometimes when you lose a loved one, like there's the natural time of mourning and that's so valuable and so important. And scripture even says that you, you mourn with those who mourn and you weep with those who weep. And that's so important to, to walk out and, and be healthy. But it, it's, it's not a, an outcry. It's not a woe is me. It's not a, you're like, okay, this, is, this happened. We're moving through it. And it seems like their faith is unfazed or even someone with a debilitating disease. They're just unfazed by it or even a diagnosis. It hits them and you're like, what on earth? It's a crisis or a challenge that happens in their life that would cripple many, but not them. If, um, if anything, it seems like it, uh, they were created for that moment. That in that moment of crisis, their capacity increases. Their character almost becomes that much stronger. What may crush the faith of some actually seems to cement their faith. Leaving you to wonder, what on earth is their faith made of? Which might make you think it's, it might not be made of something of this earth. It might be something much higher. That's what I want to talk about today. The idea of how to live life with an unfazed faith. Now faith doesn't, a faith, a faith that doesn't falter in the face of adversity or, um, but rises to meet and even overcome whatever comes your way. And so whenever we talk about faith, or one of the, the, the key verses or key chapters in the entire Bible that you'd go to when you talk about faith is Hebrews chapter 11, right? And that, that is often called, called the, uh, the hall of faith in Scripture. And it goes through and it talks about all of these individuals in the Old Testament that they did all of these amazing things. It was by faith that they did them. It was by faith that they were enabled to do the things that they did. And so we're going to walk through this and talk through this. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to, uh, that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. So Hebrews 11 one says this. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. So I'd love to blow through this. I'd love to just keep going and walk past this and say, okay, that's a great thing. But I just want to encourage you, when you read Scripture, don't just read it to get it done. Don't just read it to, to check a box. Read it and allow it to sink into you. Read it and observe what it says. Take a moment. Read over it. Reread it. Sometimes, depending on the frame of, of mind that I'm in, I'll read a whole chapter and not even remember what I, what I read. So I'll have to go back and reread it. So I want to encourage you when you read scripture, take a moment and just focus on it. 
and reread it and soak it up. And I want to do that right here. There's, there's 22 words in Hebrews 11.1 1, in this specific version that I'm reading here, which is the New Living Translation. But in just 22 words, the author of Hebrews gives us four ideas of what faith is. Four ideas. So I want to uh, break those down. So first of all, faith is this. Faith is confidence. Faith is confidence. Now, the definition of confidence is a feeling of self-assurance arising from one's own appreciation of, one owns abil- of one owns abil- one, one's own abilities or qualities or the feeling uh, or belief that one can rely upon someone or something. So essentially, it's, it's confidence in, in, in who you are and what you can do, or it's confidence in someone else and what they can do. Now, confidence uh, can be me believing in my abilities. It can be me believing in what my hands can do. And at times, that can be viewed as a bad thing. Now, sometimes when people, they seem overly confident, what they might seem what? A little cocky, right? You're like, oh, they're so cocky. Oh, they're such a know-it-all. Oh, they're such a... And that's... Here's the thing. When something needs to be done well, oftentimes that's a person you want to do it because they're confident, and oftentimes their confidence, hopefully, if it's tested, it's proven, there's a reason for them to have confidence, and the cockiness wears off. You're like, that person's cocky. No, actually, they're really, really good at this. Like when you go in and you're... If you're going to have heart surgery, you don't want a doctor that's like... Yeah, I think we I think I, I yeah, I think we could do this. Not the doctor you want, right? You want the doctor that's like, you know, I've done this a thousand times, you're gonna be great. Thank you. I like that doctor. Right? That's what you that's he, you could say, well, how cocky is he? No, he's confident in his ability, right? Or her ability. It's not always a bad thing. Unless, unless you only trust your own ability and forget what's available to you as a child of God. But when you remember what's available to you as a child of God and you have assurance in your own abilities, you know what that's called? That's called Godfidence. Godfidence. You ever heard that word? It's a word I heard about a year ago. I was like, that's interesting. Godfidence. That's an interesting thought, right? Uh, so Godfidence happens when you know who you are and the abilities that you have as well as whose you are and what's available to you as a child of God. Now, I just said a lot there, so I'm going to repeat that, okay? If you're taking notes, I encourage you, uh, write this down. If not, I encourage you, just internalize this, because this is a game changer right here. Even this phrase, if this is all you remember, it's well worth your visit here this morning. Godfidence happens when you know who you are and the abilities that you have, as well as whose you are and what's available to you as a child of God. Godfidence plays out in our lives when this happens. When we work as if everything depends upon us, and we pray as if everything depends upon God. I heard that phrase about eight years ago, nine years ago, and it stuck with me. There's power when you work as if everything depends upon you. Because God's not just like, all right, well, I'm just going to do everything for you. That's not how God works. God's waiting for us to step out. God's waiting for us to do something. He's waiting for our works to, to, to show our faith. Paul talks about this. He says, hey, you know, you say that faith without works is dead, and I show you my faith by my works. Faith and works have to accompany each other. Faith and action has to accompany each other. Otherwise, it's just talk, right? One day I'll do this. One day this will happen. Well, why, why, not, why can't one day be today? Why not today? Think about this. Think about Here's, here's examples of uh, of. Uh, people in, in Scripture that, were, that had Godfidence, that it, it, they uh, showed this. David had Godfidence when he ran towards Goliath. When you read the story of David and Goliath, it always kind of blows me away. It always blows me away when here's a kid, he's got a sling and five smooth stones in a little bag, and he's running towards a giant who has an armor bearer with a shield. He's got his... his um, uh, his javelin, his spear, he's got his sword, and here's this kid running towards him. Why would he do that? Everything in your human, like your, 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 your body, your instincts would scream, don't go, be afraid, fear. That's the type of fear that would save your life right there, right? But yet he ran towards it because he knew here was a giant who was defiling the armies of the living God. 
And he was about to do something about it because he understood that God was with him. He understood that as a child of God, what was available to him, but he also understood his own abilities. He also understood that as he stood before Saul and said, hey, you know what? When a lion came after the lamb, I went after the lion and I killed the lion and I got the lamb back. Or when a bear came after, I took my sling and my staff and I killed the bear and got the lamb back. He had confidence in his own ability. It's not a bad thing. Here's another example. Elijah, he had confidence when he called down fire from heaven three different times. Three different times Elijah called fire down from heaven. He was a prophet in the Old Testament. There was a time where all these prophets of Baal were challenging him. And he said, let fire fall from heaven. It did. It consumed the offering. It was incredible. There's another time where a soldier came up and he was dishonoring the prophet of God, the man of God. And Elijah said, if, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall from heaven. And it did twice. Three different times fire fell from heaven. Now that's confidence, right? When you say something like that, something abnormal. Like who thinks of that? Who imagines the idea, you know, I want fire to fall from heaven? Well, that's obviously someone who's inspired by what God can do. How about this? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had confidence when they wouldn't bow before the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now the king, he said, here's the deal. If you don't bow, you will die. It's either bow or die. Worship me or die. And they said, whether our God will save us or not, we will not worship you. But surely our God will save us. Now that's confidence, right? Even when, the, the, even when uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was so angry that he said, heat the furnace seven times hotter, they still said, that's all right. And they got thrown in there. And the men that thrown him in there actually died because it was so hot. I love this story. I, I encourage you, go back and maybe some of the stories you've, you've heard as a kid or maybe you've read as an adult, go back and reread them. Read them slower. Get a different version of the Bible. Just get a different perspective on it. It's, I, I just did this. I just got a new version of the Bible like three years ago. I've read through it. And I'm, I'm reading through it. And I'm reading these different, these different stories. I'm like, this is incredible. It's like a new perspective on an old story that's truly life-changing. And you see the faith of these young men. And it's, it's so inspiring. I want to encourage you to do that. The, these, these illustrations, they had uh, assurance in their own abilities because they knew who they were, they knew their identity, and they knew what was available to them. They knew, they understood their own abilities, but they also understood whose they were and that they were children of God. And because of that, what was available to them, and that's why they had confidence. So the next thing faith is, is this. It's hope. It's hope. Now, hope is a powerful thing. Hope is a powerful thing. And maybe you don't quite understand how powerful hope is until hope is gone. Until you feel hopeless. It's oftentimes in the dark that you realize how bright the light is, right? That's kind of the idea with hope, is that when it's gone, it's, it's just it's, it's a, a vacancy. It's a, a void. This is what uh, the definition of hope is. Hope is a, a feeling of ex, uh, expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Hope to get through challenges. Now, that'll give you unfazed faith, right? When you have a hope that something is going to happen. This is what Hebrews 6, 19 says. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and steadfast. Now, that anchor is the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, that anchor is the, the hope of what we will receive as followers of Jesus. When we surrender our lives to Jesus and what he's done uh, in the world for us, that gives us hope. gives us hope of what's to come. It's an anchor for our soul that secures our lives in the middle of our storms. Now, another way to stay, to stay steadfast is unshakable or even unfazed. Faith in Jesus will give you a feeling of expectation for a certain thing to happen and a hope that can never be taken from you. The next thing that faith is, it's assurance. Assurance. This is uh, what the, the author of Hebrews 1 Hebrews 11.1, 1, this is the third one that he, he wrote here. Assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence uh, or a promise. It's a positive declaration. Now, this is more than like positive self-talk. Like, have you heard those? Like positive self-talk? Like, sometimes uh, I'll, I'll go, I'll be doing something with someone or working with some, someone on something like, oh, so stupid. And you know, like, they're talking to themselves. And you're like, buddy, it's, it, you're... 
you're not stupid, okay? Like, that may not have been smart. Doesn't make you stupid, okay? Like, like you, I, I want to challenge them in their self-talk because it's so important, right? But this is more than positive self-talk. This is more than simply, like, words of encouragement, like, hey, bud, you're going to get through this. It's more than that. These are words that come out of your mouth that confidently claim and proclaim all that's available to you according to the Word of God as a child of God. Hebrews 11.3 tells us this. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. If you read through Genesis, you'll see the story of creation. You'll see that God spoke in creation came about. It was amazing. At his command, all that we know and see came about. It's incredible. And I love this. Um, that we now know uh, that, that, excuse me, what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. I love that. Just the idea of like, what we see now was never even imagined before. At God's command, creation came to be. All that we know all that we've seen and beyond was formed at his declaration, right? Jesus said this. Jesus said, uh, you'll do even greater things than me. He also said that with God, all things are possible. He also said that when you pray, not only will I hear you, but I'll answer you. Paul said this. He said that the same spirit that, ro that rose or raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And here's the point. Here's the point I'm trying to make. And you have to hear this because this is so powerful. As a child of God, if you'll do even greater things than Jesus, which I still don't fully understand, uh, because with God all things are possible, and if he hears you and will answer you when you pray in the same life-giving spirit that uh, rose Christ from that it lives in you, if all of that is true, your positive declaration is powerful. The words that come out of your mouth are powerful. They can define the future. And you're like, what does that mean? Think about this. If you wake up and you're like, well, this is a cruddy day. You know what you're going to have? A cruddy day. You'll have a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you wake up and you say, hey, man, this is an incredible day. You want to know why? I'm going to rejoice because today is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> right? It might start off horrible. It might start off on the total wrong side of the bed. But you know what? God, I know you can redeem this day. I know you can make this day good because of your word and what your word has promised me. You can begin to claim it and proclaim it. You don't have to live as a victim to whatever your day might bring about, but as a victor regardless of what it brings about, right? This is your positive declaration is powerful. Your words matter. Your words reflect what's in your heart. Did you know that? It says in scripture that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you ever want to know where someone's heart is, listen to their words. Sometimes I'll say something, and I, I, I have to sit back a little bit because I'm shocked at what came out of my mouth. Not like a great way, but in a like, I need to spend more time with Jesus way. Because either my faith is not there, I'm not proclaiming what's available to me or what's possible to me because I'm a child of God. I'm proclaiming much lesser. It's almost like I'm accepting defeat rather than proclaiming victory. Your words matter. Your, power, your, your declaration, your positive declaration is powerful. Your words give life or death to the dreams that God has given you. Just think about that. Your words give life or death to the dreams that God has given you. It's so powerful. The author of Hebrews, uh, who is unknown to us, uses the words, things we cannot see at the end of Hebrews 11, 11, 1, to describe the fourth thing that faith is. You know what another way to, to say things that you cannot see is? Imagination. It's imagination. It's imagining things. Imagination is the faculty or action of forming new ideas or images or concepts of ex uh, external objects not present to the senses. It's this idea of dreaming up things that aren't even present yet things that haven't even been seen yet. And we as followers of Christ, we have that capacity, but oftentimes we don't tap into it. We don't, we don't tap into what's available to us. You know, oftentimes we'll, we'll look at individuals like, like Steve Jobs, and we'll look at what he's created, how somehow, some way, what used to take a warehouse 
to, to house now is housed in the size of a, an iPad or an iPhone or even an iPod. I mean, the technology there, and, and if you hear the story, they came, the, the engineers came to, to Steve and said, hey, Steve, here's, here's what we have in mind. This is what we're thinking. He's like, that's not what I want. I want it to look like this. Well, Steve, it can't look like that. No, it has to look like this. But Steve, it can't it, make it look like this. And they fit it into the original iPod. And then they have the iMac. And they have these different things. And you hear these stories, and you're like, oh, that's really awesome. But just the imagination piece, right? Then there's... Um, What's his name? He, he, uh, the Tesla guy, right? You guys know this guy. What's his name? Elon Musk. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that was a Q&A. Nice work, guys. You guys are with me. You guys passed the test. But you hear these crazy ideas coming out of his mind, right? Like people are like, you can never do that. How could you ever do that? Well, the crazy thing about someone like Elon Musk is that he actually believes what he says can be a reality. Even if it's like, hey, let's send someone to the moon, Right? <laughs> It's crazy. You're like, you're like, well, that will never happen. I bet you in 20 years, there'll be so many things that aren't possible today that will be then that we might think, well, that will never happen. And it happens every day. These individuals have tapped into the power of imagination, but it'd be interesting to know. I don't know if they're, if they're, if they're doing it uh, to, to serve God or to serve self. But what if we as followers of Christ... What if we as Christians tapped into the power that's available to us and we started asking the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and show us the future and to see what would happen, see what could happen? I'd love to see it. I mean, I think that would be amazing. Imagination, it's the faculty and action of forming new ideas or Im images or concepts of external objects not present to our senses. Things we cannot see. Faith is the foundation of imagination. Without faith, imagination is an exercise in futility. This is what Hebrews 6, uh, 11, 6 says. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists, A, and he, he rewards those who sincerely seek him. First of all, we have to have faith to go to God. To believe in God, to put our faith in God, to trust our future with God, to trust our present with God. We have to have faith in that. And then secondly, we have to believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's faith that gives us the confidence, the hope, the assurance that what we imagined and beyond can become a reality. Here's the thing, we can follow the examples of those that went before us. If we're wondering, what does this look like, or how does this work, or uh, give me an idea, Jeff, what do you mean? Here's some uh, examples from Hebrew 11. Hebrew 11, 8 says this, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. That just didn't make sense, guys. If you're Abraham, you're like, what do you want me to do? You want me to leave? This is what Abraham does. He went without knowing where he was going, right? Many of you wives are like, that sounds like a family trip we just went on. My husband <laughs> didn't know where he was going. This was about faith. This was Abraham saying, God, I don't know where you want me to go, but I'll go. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine your day? Someone's like, what are you doing today? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> what do you mean? Just your calendar? Yeah, I have a calendar and I have an agenda and stuff, but I, I'm not sure what to do, where to start, where to even start walking. That's what Abraham did. That was, he didn't know where to go, but he started. Imagination helps us to see what could be and should be. That's what he did. He, he walked forward trusting, okay, God, if you said it, if you said it, I believe it. If you, if you said it, 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 it can be, then, okay, let's make it happen. Here's Hebrews 11, 7a. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. I think one of the things, one of the most profound things that uh, I, ca I came to understand about the story of, of uh, Noah and the ark was that before the flood came, it had never rained. It literally had never rained. If you read through the story, you read through the scripture, you see the way that the world was uh, irrigated at, at that point or the way that water came to the plants, it actually came up from the ground. 
But this was something they'd never seen it before, water falling from the sky. This was a brand new experience. So for him, you imagine the ark. I mean, it took him, I think it took him like a hundred years to build. People have been like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? The amount of ridicule that he received day after day after day. He did something that had never happened before. Imagination helps us to conceive it before we can create it. That's what he did. He conceived this idea. It was conceived in his mind, but the Holy Spirit literally downloaded exact measurements to him of what to do and what to build. Here's Hebrews 11.30. It was by faith that, people of, uh, that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Just before that, it talks about the idea of that like, it was by faith that the Israelites left Egypt. It was by faith that they walked through the bottom of the Red Sea on dry ground. It was by faith that they knew that when uh, Egypt, the, the armies of Egypt were coming at them, the Red Sea was behind them. It was by faith that they knew that God would make a way for them. And he did. And then they walked a little further, and, and for 40 years later, they're standing at the, the, the shores or the, the shore of the Jordan River, about to step in in flood season, knowing, okay, the promised land is right there. I can see it, but before I can be there, I have to step out. The moment the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped out, the water stopped. They walked across on dry ground. I love the story. You should go back and read this. It's in Joshua. It's an incredible story. But it was by faith that they walked into the promised land. And once they're in the promised land, the first place that they came up to was the city of Jericho, a city that had walls so wide that two chariots could race around it. It's hard for us to conceive that today. But that's how wide the walls were. It's amazing, though, in this moment that they marched around it for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Imagination helps us to form it before we can put feet to it. Whatever the dream is, whatever the idea is, whatever, the, whatever we imagine. Sometimes imagination looks a lot like perspiration. <laughs> looks a lot like work. Consider the people of Israel as they move their feet step by step, day after day, around the walls of Jericho for seven days as they, probably a million plus people at this point, walked around the walls for seven days in a row, then seven times the final day. They walked in the dirt, the dust, the heat. Why? <laughs> How many times do you think that question went through their mind? Have you ever stepped out in faith, even a small step, and wondered, why am I doing this? Maybe you moved across country. Maybe you, you walked across the cubicle to, to introduce yourself to a new person. You're an introvert, but you're like, okay, God, I think I should introduce myself to this person, but why am I doing this? It's the first step, right? Have you ever wondered that? I'm sure they wondered that like crazy. Every single step, they couldn't talk. One of the things was like, hey, we have to be silent. So he's just walking, probably pondering, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? All day, right? What was going to happen? I mean, what could possibly happen at the end of seven times and then seven times the final day? What could possibly happen? I, I bet you what happened, none of them imagined. I bet you the reality of when they screamed that after the seventh time, when they blew the horns, when they shouted... I bet you what happened did not even come into their imagination. Oh, the walls are going to fall. Did not see that coming. It was probably like, okay, so we're going to scream and shout, blow our horns, and then what? We're going to crash the wall. Why didn't we do this seven days ago, right? They didn't see it. But yet they had faith. They trusted. Step after step, day after day. I'm sure it got old. I'm sure they wanted to quit. I'm sure they felt stupid. Have you ever felt stupid stepping out in faith? If you haven't, you should take a bigger step. Because faith will make you feel stupid sometimes. Maybe not the faith itself, but the people watching you. I'm sure there was individuals on the wall that were like looking at them, ridiculing. Hey, they're walking. You guys can walk. Good job. <laughs> I'm sure that was happening. I'm sure that was going on. I'm sure they were trying to intimidate the Israelites, but they just kept walking. They just kept walking. Maybe even rather than walking around the wall, I'm sure they wanted to walk away. You know, I'm just going to head back. Let's just call it a day, right? But here's what we need to understand. Steps taken in faith are never futile. Steps taken in faith are never futile. 
If you've never taken a step of faith, your faith will never be tested. And if you remember from last week, before something can be trusted, what? It has to be tested. A faith that's tested can be trusted. For the Israelites, every step, every day was one step closer to God's good, pleasing, and perfect will being revealed in their lives. You have no idea how close God's will is to your life. You have no idea what he's about to reveal to you really is. And if you stop walking, you may never experience it. Imagine if they'd stopped walking. Imagine if they'd stopped on day five or stopped on day six or stopped on rotation six on day seven. They never would have seen the walls fall. But instead, they continued to walk. They continued to trust. They continued to say, okay, God, okay. They went from things that we cannot see to stepping into the promise that God had for them. The next one is this, and this is, I believe this is a word for someone today. This is Hebrews 11, 11. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. As good as dead. Has something died in your life today? Maybe a dream, maybe a hope, maybe something you've imagined Maybe you thought, man, I thought it would be different, or I I envisioned this, or I thought one day this would happen. One day this job, this career, this home, this family, this, what is it? Has something in your life died today? The death of a dream? Can I encourage you to speak life into it? Can I encourage you to, to trust God for it? Can I remind you that your positive declaration has power? What might seem dead, maybe it's just dormant. Maybe what you hoped for years ago has been dormant for the right season. Maybe God's been waiting and testing you like he tested Joseph. He gave Joseph the dream as a teenager and it didn't come to fruition until he was in his 30s. Maybe there's 20 years of testing so that God can know, okay, I can trust him with this. I can trust her with that dream. Because I promise you, God's dreams for you are bigger than your dreams for you. Your wildest imagination doesn't touch what God imagines for you. I promise you. That's our God. That's who he is. So if you're walking through a season of what you would say, hey, this is like the, 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 the valley of the shadow of death. If you're walking through that season, begin to speak life. Begin to speak life. Begin to say, no, you know what, God? I, I, it said in scripture that you're faithful to complete what you've started. So as it says in scripture. It says that no weapon formed against us shall, shall prosper. It begin, just begin to quote scripture, begin to speak life against that thing that's come against you. Then it goes on. I, just, I love this part. I, I love this. A man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there was no way to count them. It was interesting. What, what looked dead produce descendants greater than the the sand on the seashore and the the stars in the sky. When others give up, that's when God's just getting started. See, Sarah could have given up on this dream. She laughed at it, but she didn't give up on it. You see, when others give up, that's when God's just getting started. And he's looking for people to get started with, not just talkers, but risk takers, not just theologians, but practitioners. Not just churchgoers, but kingdom builders. There's a difference because sometimes I go, I go to church and that's good and all, but it's more than that. Like you can go to church and never truly experience what it means to build the kingdom. Now building a kingdom, that's an invitation into what God has imagined for you. It's not just, well, I read my Bible and I go to church. That's great. That's, That's Christian thinking. That's really great. But I want to introduce you to a thought called kingdom thinking. It's bigger than just crossing all of the T's and dotting all of the I's and making sure the to-do list is checked off and that you've done all these things. It's more than that. It's when you're like, all right, God, what is the crazy, amazing adventure you want to call me in today? Not just for my life, because the way you live your days for God is the way you'll live your life for God. Every day, 
Get up every day saying, all right, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? And go after it. That's the idea. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for people to invite into this process. He's looking for people to get it started with. What was interesting is, is that God's looking for people that will not just imagine the impossible, but are willing to embark upon the impossible. Everything that God asked these people to do, they had never imagined before. It had never been done before. Can I ask you something? What if God is asking you to do something that's never been done before? Is that crazy to think about? Sometimes I think about that, and it's a frightening thought, but it's an, an, just an exhilarating thought. God has the ability to do that if you believe it, if you know what's available to you. Now, let me ask you this. If God's asking you, what if he's asking you to imagine um, the impossible with him? To imagine the impossible for your family. To imagine the impossible for your marriage. To imagine the impossible for your relationships. To imagine the impossible for your careers to imagine the impossible for maybe even the prodigals in your life. The ones that people are like, they're so far gone, there's no way they're coming back. What if God's saying, hey, you know what? I'm gonna put away the 99. We're gonna go after the one. I'd love for you to come with me and be a part of this. It's up to you, but I'm going after him. What if God did that? Because he does. What if God's saying that to you today? He's saying, hey, I'm going after him. I'd love for you to come, but I'm not waiting for you. He invites us into this crazy, amazing, awesome adventure called kingdom building, right? We can be a part of this if we so choose. So let me ask you, would you do it? If God invited you into the impossible, he invited you to imagine the impossible, would you do it? Would you step in? Would you, would you be willing to do it? Would you like to be a part of something that's never been done before? I know I would. Stuff like that just drives me like, okay, God, what can we do here? What is something that maybe it's never been done before, but well, how can we do this? You know, the phrase that drives me absolutely mad is this. Well, that can't be done. You can't do that. Mm -mm, can't be done. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. <laughs> it's not a matter of like, it can't be done. It's a matter of, well, how? Okay, maybe you can't see it. Maybe we can't see it right now. Let's change our perspective. Let's turn a little bit. Let's see if there's a different angle we can see this at and go after it and say, okay, God, open my mind, open my imagination. Show me what I'm not seeing so that what I think could be and should be will be. Would God, if God invited you into that, would you do it? Well, if you would, I have three steps for you to take. Step one is this, start imagining with God. Start imagining with God. Invite God into your brainstorming sessions. Invite God, start imagining, start dreaming with God. Acts 2.17 says this, in the last days which we're in, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Through the power of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day the church was born, we have the ability to imagine with God, to see visions of what could be, and to dream dreams of what should be. Just because the Holy Spirit is present in us, we have this ability. That's what's available to us. We can begin to imagine with God. Step two is this. Stop saying that's impossible. Just stop saying it. Stop saying that's impossible. Hebrews 12, 1a says this, therefore, since the, uh, we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Oftentimes, you know, the next part of it is, uh, you know, it talks about the sin that so easily entangles. But what about this? What if, what if one of the weights that slows you down is your current way of thinking? What if that's what it is? What if that's one of the things that's holding you back, the way that you're thinking? Romans says, don't conform to the world around you, but be transformed by, the, by the, the renewing of your mind. So don't listen to what screams impossible. Be transformed into realizing what God said, that with God, all things are possible. And then start proclaiming it. Because your proclamation, your words, your words have power. Final step is this. Step out in faith. At some point, you have to take a step. At some point, you actually have to step out and do it. No one ever changed the world by sitting around. They just didn't. 
Your faith is activated when you step out. So start working as if everything depends upon you and praying as if everything depends upon God. That's what it will take to have unfazed faith in your life. Pray with me if you would. Jesus, thank you for the incredible examples of faith that we see in Hebrews, that we see in the individuals that followed you and trusted you and understood who they were and their abilities and, and whose they were and what was available to them as your children. God, I pray that you'd show us, open our eyes to, to live the same way. God, to live a way that for some meets, might seem kind of crazy, for some might seem uh, even a little risky, but with you, God, it's not risky. It's, it's what we're supposed to be doing. It's the way we're supposed to be living. It's not a matter of risk. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trusting you and believing that even though we can't see it, it could be and it should be. God, I pray even now. Lord, I pray even now over this church and over this house. Lord, that even now you'd begin to open our minds to what you have available to us. Open our minds to, to what we can do as we follow you. Open our minds to what's available to us as your sons, as your daughters, as your children. Jesus, give us ideas we've never had before. Give us ideas that maybe no one else on this earth has and even trusted them to us. To act upon, to do something with, to make a reality. You're inviting us into this incredible process in this life that you partner with us and you make incredible things happen. Jesus, I pray that you'd help us to imagine what could be, what should, what, what should be, Lord. I pray that, I ask that in your name. Amen.